All right, thanks, Kyle. That's a little loud. Can you guys hear me? There you go. How are y'all doing today? Good. Just a quick, a quick show of hands so we can maybe guide the conversation today. How many of you are what I would call technical? Okay, great. A good part of the audience, and the, all the rest will say non-technical, right? <laughs> We're more on the finance side. Um, we just have a couple slides here to guide the conversation. Um, my name is Trenton Truitt. I'm with, uh, I'm with KubeCost, and the goal here today is to make sure that we get your questions answered. And as we've been talking, we want to leave y'all with some gifts, right? The gifts of maybe mistakes that y'all yeah. have made, uh, mistakes of what you could do differently, and really, this time is yours. Uh, and so, just quickly, introduction on KubeCost. Again, my name's Trenton. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of us or not, but we're a leader in the Kubernetes space. We help companies with their visibility of Kubernetes. Uh, we help them with their um, observability. And we help them with you know, uh, putting guardrails on your spend, if you will, as once you understand your spend. We're used by thousands of companies around the world. We manage about $3 billion of, of, of spend. But this time is not about us. This time is about Parag and about Ganesh. So Ganesh, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, excuse me, Parag, you go. <laughs> yeah. So hey, my name is Parag. So I work for uh, American for my last uh, eight years, nine years. So we saw the journey from on-prem to the cloud. And uh, we focusing now, our goal is cloud first for uh, our applications. Uh, we majorly on the Azure side, we build a lot of AKS cluster as well as our uh, app services, uh, logic apps. Uh, we are the big customer of Databricks and we use the data clusters. And we learn a lot of from our mistakes again. Yeah. Uh, and now, that's what like we are, have a stable environment and focusing on the uh, FinOps. Uh, foundations and the framework how we can implement in our services, not only the Kubernetes, along with the other Azure services yeah. and all those things. Yeah. Ganesh. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Ganesh Janakraman. I lead the platform engineering at Broadcom. And uh, I just want to say a big uh, thanks to the FinOps conference, the yeah. organizers, for a fantastic conference. It's been very... Uh, informative, very relevant, and useful. So thanks once again for all the organizers. I think a, a big shout out. Uh, when you think of Broadcom, uh, generally uh, people associate us with uh, silicon hardware uh, and chips, which is uh, natural because we're one of the leaders in that space. Um, and we take immense pride in uh, that 99% of internet traffic touches Broadcom, right? So uh, we are definitely uh, a hardware company. But we are also one of the largest enterprise software companies today in the world. Uh, we are uh, very acquisitive. We've acquired companies like uh, CA, Symantec, uh, and a few more. Uh, and we're still in the news uh, uh, for, for our, for our M&A. And um, so we have a wide range of solutions uh, in the software space, uh, touching all the way from mainframe, mainframe products, to largest, uh, one of the largest payment authentication solutions to security solutions, I talked about semantic, uh, like we do endpoint, DLP, all of those. Um, and we offer these solutions uh, both as on-prem, but uh, I think what is uh, more relevant to this conversation here is we can talk about uh, some of the SaaS offerings that we have. So we have a fairly large SaaS portfolio of services that we run in uh, different clouds, Amazon, Azure, and uh, GCP is our largest provider. And uh, as far as Kubernetes is, is, is concerned, like we have been on the Kubernetes journey since uh, 2016. That's when we went live with our first set of services. And uh, it's been a really, I would say, some extent rocky, some extent uh, uh, interesting, but mostly very, very productive journey uh, into Kubernetes. So we have a fairly large real estate in terms of Kubernetes is concerned. We run over 200 large clusters. Uh, our services run in about uh, 40 plus uh, uh, geographies. And uh, uh, again, we run hundreds of thousands of uh, workloads, actually. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, um, as we've been, the three of us are really going to know each other, that you come from very different industries, right? <laughs> Airline, and then, you know, Broadcom and tech and growth by, you know, all these amazing acquisitions. But let's talk about a lot of things you had in common. Right, when it came to Kubernetes, when it came to some of the technical decisions you were being making, and maybe 
the challenges you had as you were implementing FinOps as a practice, right? As we talked about kind of people, process, and technology. So I would start like, I would say like even our uh, business is different, but every business is behind with the IT technical things. Mm -hmm. uh, every company is uh, uh, IT based. I would say like uh, uh, we are flying all the round the clock. Mm -hmm. and every flight have uh, integrate with our IT services or applications. And the same with the Broadcom also. So the common thing is with every industry is the IT. And everybody is relying their business on the IT and the services. Absolutely, I think that's uh, that, that's well said. Right? Uh, today we are in a world where uh, all companies are software companies. Right? Yeah. Be uh, drilling oil, or uh, uh, I think somebody sp spoke about every truck being being tracked. So uh, we are in this uh, um, space where um, software kind of runs everything. Um, in the reason why we went to Kubernetes, I think they're, they're talking about commonality uh, trend is like, uh, uh, again, we have grown through acquisitions. Even right. the companies that we acquired grew through acquisitions. Why don't you, why don't you name a few companies <laughs> that they might recognize that you've so, acquired? Yeah, say, say for example, uh, I'd say, say CA Technologies, uh, right, or Symantec. So um, the, the challenge was that uh, the products that were made were made in different time frames. Some of these products are like uh, born in the cloud, can run well in the cloud. Uh, some of them um, were probably built at a time when the only cloud we knew was something up in the sky. Right? Right. So, so, uh, so with these acquisitions, what happens is for you to run and operate, you need to uh, scale linearly because the way it was built is different, the way it's deployed is different, where they're running is it, it's all different. Right. So, we had to identify something common, uh, some uh, common platform where this could run. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, again, back in around the 2015, 16 time frame when you're looking for a solution. <coughs> and then Docker was taking off, and uh, Kubernetes was there. So the combination of Kubernetes and Docker gave us that common platform. So I think that's where our Kubernetes journey started. And uh, like many, around, uh, uh, many folks that I spoke in the last uh, a couple of days, um, uh, Kubernetes is a uh, very, uh, it's one of the most sophisticated uh, tools out there. Right. If I can call it a tool, uh, framework, software, whatever, right? But uh, you need to um, build, your, uh, build your software in a particular way for you to uh, take advantage of that. Right. Question on the technology for the technologists in the world. We've got people that are managing huge Kubernetes implementations here. Yeah. No? Oh, we got one in the back. All right, let's hear it. Just yell it out. Are the do you serverless and native cloud services, stuff like that? Well, one more time. I, I didn't catch it. You guys caught it. I didn't catch it. Yeah. Is Kubernetes the primary strategy, or do you use serverless and other okay. cloud native services? Yeah. So the question is, Kubernetes is your, your, your sole focus and strategy? So, uh, right? I, I would say, like, uh, in American, but we have decided we will be architect the uh, application and whether that application is uh, containerized or not. And based on that architect, our first preference is uh, containerized with the Kubernetes. If uh, there are some uh, architect issues or external uh, connection integration with the database or something, then we will go to the past services and the final option is our IAS. So that's what like American is doing. The, I want to continue his point, like why we use the Kubernetes because of the simplified infrastructure. You don't need an overlay of your operating system, managing the operating systems or the hardware or a single pane of glass. You can use multiple uh, application, whether it's a Java or a .NET on a single uh, Kubernetes cluster. So uh, that's a trick to us. And our first priority is containerized our applications and then the other options. Do you want to comment on that, Ganesh, or no? Do you yeah, want again, oh. uh, it's a, it's a, uh, the strategy is very similar to what uh, uh, Parag said, right? So Kubernetes uh, is our primary strategy. In fact, we migrated, uh, I would say, on the SaaS side, well over 90% of our services run on Kubernetes. Uh, we do have uh, serverless. It's not tech concern, but uh, very targeted for, 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 uh, for specific use cases. In fact, we run something called Knative as well. So that's like your uh, serverless uh, being cloud agnostic. So we have that use case as well. Good. Go ahead. Hi. Hey. 
uh, with the evolution of acquisitions and mergers and acquiring all these tech companies with tech debt and teams, how did you evolve? What your team looked like from uh, on-prem to IaaS to cloud native? How'd you manage and where are you today? You want to repeat the question, Ganesh? Yeah, so the, I think the question is like uh, this whole uh, journey of evolution, like I think many of us here come from a core data center background, like uh, as in like we've run services uh, in, the, in the data center. So from that to we're talking uh, without servers. I think somebody asked about serverless. Right? So from full data center to, to serverless, what has the journey been, right? So maybe I'll start first. Uh, please feel free to add, Parag. So uh, the journey uh, has been um, very um, uh, interesting, right? So interesting in a, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways. It's been very uh, productive in, in, a, in uh, uh, many, uh, many areas. But there have been a lot of uh, learnings, right, in, in, the, in this course. Say, for, say for example, um, from our, uh, uh, we are uh, very familiar with, uh, um, uh, with how things used to uh, uh, run in uh, DC, right? Say, say, for example, load balancing or the, or the firewalls. The moment you come into the cloud space, all of those uh, terms are still there, but uh, the way they work is different, right? But I think your the question, if I read, if we read the, I think from from a technology perspective, there are significant differences uh, between each of these, and we've kind of uh, uh, gone over uh, gone over each one of these, uh, um, making mistakes, realizing, fixing it, right? Uh, but purely from a um, process perspective, things have uh, simplified uh, enormously, right? So, and that journey I can explain with uh, what we did in, in our DevOps space. Say, say for example, um, back. Ten years back, a uh, uh, lot of things were manual, right? Today, everything that we build, actually, uh, there, is, there, there is code, right? Uh, it's called, uh, say, for example, infrastructure as code, configuration as code. Anything that we change is a change into Git, and that triggers a pipeline, and, and then the change happens, right? So there's a lot of automation that has come, that has eased this process, that has helped us to adopt uh, uh, these technologies. But the journey has been like, it's been a great learning experience in each step, actually. Thanks, so, uh, in my thing, like, uh, we, we are moving our on-prem workload to the cloud. So, uh, we learn a lot from our mistake, and I can explain today <laughs> what we are doing. So, uh, we restructure our application and make sure that application is uh, well friendly with the containerized and then we'll move to the, uh, our application using the CI-CD pipeline, same, the gate and the YAML and all those things. Uh, we have our on-prem, uh, sorry, in-house solution uh, for the creating the namespace so that we have a standardize on the namespace side for every shared cluster so that like it is a standard for everyone and uh, we can govern those policies and make sure those clusters is compliance with our uh, compliance things. So uh, we containerized architect and then move it to the cloud right now and we start doing some monitoring also using the certain tools like a cube cost or other tools where we can see our spend. Also, we will see, see our governance, policies, and all those things. No, thank you for the question. We've got a question up here. Yes, ma'am. You ready? Oh. <laughs> We're all learning here. Thank you. Uh, both of you come from really strong engineering leadership backgrounds, um, and you use a product like KubeCost. How do, what do you think is the biggest challenge, even while using a tool, with Kubernetes cost management. So what's the biggest challenge? So I would start in my experience, like uh, when we start, everybody wants to go to the Kubernetes, whether it makes sense or not. <laughs> so we, we, we saw those things like, uh, uh, I would say the first one is like, we need to be uh, a solid foundation when we are start a Kubernetes journey. Uh, you have to be a hands-on experience on the Kubernetes uh, because it, it's a simplified, but again, it's a complex system because you have to be learn about your infrastructure, storage, networking, and everything. So you should have a hands-on experience. Automation is the key for Kubernetes because 
through the automation, you can make your standardized and make sure you can uh, analyze your environment pretty easy. Uh, for us, like when we start our journey, uh, we move some of the legacy applications and we saw unknown 500, 400 errors. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, we walked through and we saw some difficulties. So we come in the end and make some standards and uh, asking to the business teams or the uh, business IT teams to fill those standards, make the applications containerized. If it's need to be redesigned, they will be redesigned. And then we move to that. So uh, now we have a goal, okay, if it makes sense, then only we will move to the containerized. Otherwise, we will be see other options. That's a good question. Um, uh, Maybe I, I'll answer it from, from the cost perspective. Uh, uh, in fact, a lot of speakers that I heard both yesterday and today, right? Uh, we went through the same journey. In the sense, uh, um, uh, you are in an uh, environment where everything was capex. You need to ask for things well in advance. And once you get a server, you, you hug the server and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, right? So we were in that stage. And once the cloud opened up, uh, right? Uh, uh, it was like a kid in the candy shop. We, we run Namak. Then there's a sticker shock, and then there's a governance. Right? So FinOps happened, uh, I would say, as an afterthought. We did not have this practice till we saw those bills. And um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the cost management, uh, the, the traditional way to do cost management still applies, like how we do budgeting, forecasts, um, all of those. But I think I heard a very good uh, uh, speech earlier today in terms of uh, all of those are happening on steroids now. Right? So, when what we used to do once a year happens once a month, right? So um, the velocity is uh, very different, like how we, use, how we used to manage costs, right? So gone are the days when you used to look at the bill once a month. That was probably a few years back. Now people are looking at it on a daily basis, right? So, uh, so I think the biggest change from a cost management perspective is just the speed. How, how do you take, go ahead, another question. Yes, sir. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so technical philosophy question here, right? So for the engineers in the room, um, every cluster you spin up on Kubernetes comes with a, you know, the control plane cost, right? How do you guys think about when do you break up clusters and how do you fill those clusters optimally? And what part does your FinOps program play in that decision? Um, sorry, uh, break up the water game, sorry. Like, yeah, so, so how, do you, how do you break up clusters, right? So you can do one Kubernetes cluster, fill it to capacity. Oh, how do you break up clusters? Of okay. Nodes it can hold, right? Or you can do, yeah. So I, I think uh, Parag touched up on this point earlier. So uh, the, it's an, to me, again, I, I, again right? So the, it's, it's, a, it's an anti-pattern for you to not share clusters. I think what, that's one of the beauty of Kubernetes is, um, uh, extremely high resource utilization that we could achieve, right? So uh, that's the mindset that, that with which we, we started approaching the problem where we created a lot of shared clusters, right? The, the shared clusters, as you, I think uh, you, you're indicating, there's a lot of difficulty in terms of apportioning the, the cost back to the system. So, so we went from um, a, a notion of, hey, I need to leverage Kubernetes completely, this is meant for, for a complete shared environment. Uh, now we are at a stage where um, there are still, uh, we still have shared clusters. If there is an option, if, uh, if the use case is large enough, and uh, say, say for example, it already needs say a several hundred nodes for me to, uh, for the use case to, uh, to be satisfied, yeah, uh, a dedicated cluster makes sense, right? Um, what we do is like uh, your, your, your line of business, or it could be a business unit, or it could be a, um, a product family within the business unit where there's a cost center associated with that. The, the billing domain, or, or in this case, uh, my, uh, my, my cluster is actually tied to that, actually. So, um, and there is another anti-pattern which is kind of very, very, very popular now is within Kubernetes, you have an option to do node pools, right? So you can have node pools which are product specific that kind of defeats the purpose of running it in a shared environment in the first place, but that's another way to actually solve the problem. And to adding those things, like in my environment, what we have done, like uh, for costing, you have to be tagging. Your tagging policies should be uh, perfect in your cloud space. So if I take my example, like we are 98% correct tagging on resources side. Uh, 
So uh, we have a lot of shared cluster within our department and which is using by the different different business unit. And we, our YAML file, uh, which has the namespace and all those things, and our uh, automation also, uh, taking those app short name, which in my case, uh, as a tagging, and then uh, we tag our namespace according to their things, and then the tool like a monitoring, cube cost, other tools, whatever your tools have. Through that, you can drill down your costing, your total cluster cost versus your namespace cost. And uh, because of this, like uh, we found a lot of gap in our cluster right now. We are still burning a lot on the idle resources, which is the next thing for the right sizing and those things. Uh, but we calculate and we are sh show back to the business, okay, we spend that much of this amount on the AKS, but on these applications. So that we are just showing the show back, not the charge back right now. Uh, but this is the how we will do uh, the things uh, it's because of the tagging. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, you touched on this towards the end of that, but I was wondering if you could expand a bit on your approach to right sizing for resources running within the clusters. So how do you, I'm trying to repeat your question, so how do yeah. you approach the right sizing of your environment? Is that what, yeah. Yeah. That, okay. I, we, have million, we have millions of view, viewers out there. I want to make sure they hear the question. <laughs> I'd, I'd imagine if I didn't right. want to keep asking. <laughs> We're going viral here, so. So, yeah, that's, that's a, again, thing like, uh, if I think like why we go to the Kubernetes, because of the right sizing and optimize our environment. We can have an application on the VM, but we know okay, we are not consuming all the resources from the VM and there's a lot of wastage and that's why we move to the Kubernetes. There's a, again, like there's a other reasons also, but one of the reason is that. So what we are doing, like we are uh, keep monitoring, we have some of the Azure workbook, uh, which monitor our environment. And also we have uh, some uh, costing tools, which we are keep checking uh, which environment is using. And also we take the recommendations within the tools and talking to the business IT and change and more modifications, all those things. Uh, plus like uh, we have not started yet, uh, but it's in our pipeline, like uh, we are going to be uh, stop and start our AKS cluster, non-product AKS cluster uh, over the weekend so that we can save uh, compute and memory costing over there. Uh, so uh, it's a, it's an online it's an ongoing journey. You will learn and those things, and uh, I, we are still lot spending on our idle resources right now. Uh, just just to uh, add up on what uh, uh, Prak said, it's it's uh, it's an iterative process uh, for sure. Um, what uh, uh, some of the problems that we hit originally uh, a few years back was uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this concept called bin packing actually. So bin packing is a, is a, is a big issue, um, where uh, the dimension of your pod matters and how you group them uh, in a way that they can fit in a particular virtual machine, that actually matters, right? So that's a significant drain in terms of uh, what we saw moving from a, your classic VM to Kubernetes. We are not gaining a, a lot of efficiency. The other thing is, uh, I think uh, Trenton talked about, uh, uh, say, KubeCast, right? So KubeCast gives you, at a pod level, uh, like, uh, what is the uh, peak utilization when what's average utilization? And uh, within Kubernetes, you have levers like, um, say, for example, you have a request under limit, right? So you can uh, keep your request as the baseline. Uh, say, for example, in a, in a day, I mean, 18 hours, your, 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 your traffic does X, and for the other six hours, it's at 2X, right? So you can, uh, you can uh, dial those like in, in a way, to, so you can set your request uh, at, at a limit that can, that, uh, at that level that can handle your, uh, this one and limit uh, when you need. So that, again, uh, that happens over a period of time. Uh, again, uh, you, you observe uh, uh, what you're using, then, then start tuning those actions. So you all have some very big environments. Are, are you, oh, you got a question here? No, but we have some, you have some very big environments, but we talk a lot about thinking big, starting small, scaling fast. So how do you, like, what do you go bite off like first to see a great ROI? What might you migrate towards second? I mean, if when the team walks out of here today, I want to do this one thing to start moving the needle. Is there something that comes to mind that that would help them? So, uh, uh, if I take an example, like for one of the applications, uh, my teammate is here. <laughs> Let's say she came and she's saying, "Okay, 
uh, I want to build uh, applications on the Kubernetes and those things. So uh, now what's happened, like we have a, a architect department, ESU, which is uh, analyzing the applications and uh, uh, their architects, their needs. And based on that, like uh, not on the day one, but we'll analyze the consumptions. On the base of the consumption, we'll buy the RIs, reserve instance, for that specific nodes and uh, redesign those applications and uh, based on that uh, we we execute is it okay good a nice fast return ganesh what would you um i have a few things no, no, not yeah. necessarily one thing so um i think I, over the last day and a half at least i've heard this multiple times i just want to repeat it once more uh, visibility is the, is the key visibility right? that's right um and visibility to engineering i think this is something where uh, shift lift is critical Again, my two cents, I'm going to make some enemies here. Like, I think this practice should be called as DevFinOps, right? The development is kind of uh, critical to this whole effort. And uh, visibility to the developer is, uh, is actually super important. So when that happens, and when the developer knows what the constraints are, right. I think that, that's when the magic happens in terms of FinOps, right? So for us, um, I think that was a critical part. Right? I mean, any change, any migration transformation that you do, there's a lot of resistance that happens. But uh, once um, the engineers uh, who are actually building things and are actually responsible for the optimization at the, at the end of the day, once they understand uh, what is the target or uh, what are the constraints, right. uh, they, uh, they start optimizing things. So that's the first thing. And um, uh, I think uh, we talked about uh, different aspects of, uh, of, of, uh, of tuning. In fact, I'm going to probably use a tagline um, um, from an insurance uh, commercial, right? So pay only for what you need. I think, I yeah. think that, that is probably the fundamental mantra of uh, FinOps in some, uh, and, uh, you, and your needs should be what you can offer. Yeah. So as long as you're able to hit this, I think your uh, FinOps practice will, will be fine. The, the trick is, is you have the visibility, and you have to be able to understand what changes you can make without degrading your performance of all that's the applications yeah. that you've all been developed. Yeah. That, that's the key part, right? And, and being able to fine tune that and, and have the knobs to do that. We have about a minute left. Are there any other questions this afternoon? Okay, Kyle, I, okay, you have one more. Let's go, you close this out. All right, um, so do you guys use any type of auto scaling with your Kubernetes clusters? Oh yeah. Oh, I like this. And what's the impact to having to not use right sizing or any other mitigation, right? So uh, auto scaling is, um, is again one of the uh, really important capabilities that you get with Kubernetes. Um, you need to use it uh, where it works well, in the sense that uh, you I mean, uh, in the in a stateless application, it makes a lot of sense for you to use it very liberally. I think uh, it, it works well, right? Uh, in your uh, say your classic web use case. But the trick is when it comes to when your applications have a lot of state and you have used things like, say, Kafka or, or Elastic, where actually auto scaling can actually degrade the, the performance. You may think that you're improving by adding capacity, which is actually going to bring your application down. Right? So uh, uh, you need to know your application really well. So which parts of it can you auto scale and which parts you, can, you cannot. And uh, that comes as, as, as part of your architecture design, actually. And in my environment, yeah, we are using the auto scaler, uh, auto scale, and uh, plus we have uh, one of the Azure workbook, uh, which is keep monitoring my all the AKS clusters and those things. And if there is no auto scaler is available of anything that, it will be signed red and uh, send it back to us, and we'll go and work with the team and make that other. Yeah, we are. Kyle, can we keep going, or we got to cut it? We got more questions. Yeah, Any more it. questions? Thank you so much. Hopefully we set the record for as many questions answered in, in these breakouts this week. But uh, a huge thank you to Ganesh and Prague from Broadcom and American Airlines for all your help. Right? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching that session. I'm sitting here in San Diego right after FinOpsX. We hope you join us next year here live 2024. In the meantime, please subscribe to the channel and join the community. Get involved. Join the summits. Get in a working group. And don't forget to get FinOps certified. It's next year here in San Diego for FinOpsX. It's gonna be twice as big. Come join the party, come meet your people. Welcome home.